Oh, it works. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit terrified. Um, those first two presentations were pretty amazing. And um, you will very work out very, very quickly that I'm um, an accountant by trade, not necessarily a designer, which you'll see very quickly from my presentation. Um, I'm here to talk about startup safaris. Does anybody know what a startup safari is? Right, I'll ask that question at the end, and hopefully there'll be a few more hands in the air. So who am I? Um, as I described, I'm a recovering accountant. Below this t-shirt is a boring, boring person. I spent 10 years uh, in an accountancy firm. And top, uh, in 2000, during the dot-com boom, I jumped ship and actually went and worked for a startup. It lasted for about 12 months and went bust. Uh, we spent $25 million and had nothing to show for it. So it was the most amazingly spectacular, rubbish failure startup you can ever imagine. The fortunate part is I've never spent that much since and had a few more successes in between. Um, as was described, my um, over the last 15 years, essentially, I've been working in and around startups, either in them, I've founded a few of them, I've invested in a few of them, I've been in corporate finance, and as a result, what I describe is I'm actually a tradesman of many and a master of none, which is a, a nice way of saying I'm not very good at anything in particular. Um, about five years ago, my life changed when I met a guy, and he's on the next slide, a guy called David Cohen from Techstars. Um, but I had been an investor at that point in time, and discovered this weird anomaly, which was when I wrote checks, smaller checks, to startups to invest. They did better than when I wrote bigger checks. I couldn't work this out, but essentially what it was, was when you write a big check to a startup, what they feel they need to do is go into a very dark room and code for a very long time. Whereas when you have not a lot of money, what you realize very quickly is you need to get customers. And hence, I kind of came across this phenomena, which was why Combinator and Techstars and I emailed Paul Graham at Y Combinator, and I got a very short email back from him, which basically said, everything you need to know about me is on my website, go away. And I emailed David Cohen and said, can you help me? And he said, whatever I can do. So I went to Boulder, Colorado, and spent three days with him, and essentially from that, he helped me set up a program. It was called Springboard. It wasn't Texas, it was Springboard. And essentially, I ran that in London uh, for about three years. And then subsequently, he came and knocked on my door three years later and said, actually, we don't want to be in the US anymore. We want to be overseas. Do you want to run our London office? So in that moment when he said, can I help you, he was actually helping himself. He didn't know it at the time. Um, since then, Techstars has gone on to, I opened first office three years ago internationally, we now have seven international programs. And I personally think that within the next two years, actually the international programs will be, there'll be more of them than there'll be in the US. Um, I am currently unemployed. I'm between jobs. Um, and maybe you might get a hint what I might do next by the time I get to the end of this presentation. So, uh, this is the best photograph I could get these two guys. They don't sit together. Um, the guy on the your this side, that side, I can't do that tonight, um, is David Cohen, and this guy here, the long hair kitty, is uh, Brad Feld. These are the founders of Techstars. And essentially, um, for those that don't know, and I'm sure many do, the really interesting combination was what they said was if you get a little bit of money but a lot of love and support, actually it can be inherently more valuable than just money alone. And so what does that look like today? This is 
pretty amazing in terms of slide. It started in 2007 with one program in Boulder. And in 2016, I think it's about 24, 25. I can't remember how many it's announced at this point in time. Um, but there's a weird dynamic. In 2012, the green box, um, we did a program for Microsoft. And it was called the Microsoft Accelerator. And we were a little bit ashamed of it. It was like, oh, we're going to do a program for Microsoft. We don't want to do that. So we said, no, we don't want to do that. And they said, we'll give you so much money that you will want to do this program. And we went, oh, OK, fine. And then, and you can understand this, it was called the Microsoft Accelerator. And then in really small letters at the bottom, it said, powered by Techstars. So that maybe nobody noticed that we were doing it. And much to our surprise, it actually worked, and it worked really, really well. And it subsequently went on. In a weird way, we think it's successful, because actually what they did was they stole the plans, walked away, and set up their own accelerator network, which they have now around the world. In 2013, we did another one for Nike. And it was even more mind-blowing, because actually, in theory, Microsoft knew all about lean and methodologies and sprints, and they had some kind of technical background. When we actually went and spoke to corporates who had no background in technology, such as Nike, this was unbelievable. They just were completely blown away by this, the potential of helping create innovation inside their organization. In the intervening period since then, we now actually have more corporate programs than we have normal what we call city programs. And I would guess that actually going forward, that that number is going to be double. And the number of city programs is not going to change. The number of corporate programs is going to be where it's all going to come from. And internationally, that's the only way we're there to expand. Now, who knew that you can get a tour of Tech City? Everybody know where Tech City is? London? Yes? Good. So you can actually book a tour in London today to go and see startups. And people pay for this. This is a real business. But there are people who will walk you around and take you to co-work spaces. And they make a lot of money. This is what I call startup tourism. And it's insane. If anybody's had the unfortunate position of actually working in a co-work space, which is really popular, all you see is traffic. People come into the building and go, oh, look at them. They're startups. Aren't they little thing? Aren't they cute? <laughs> Oh, hello, little startup. What are you doing on social media? Mm. Oh my god, I hate it. Anyway, so there is a thing, and it's true, it's called startup tourism. If you've got a really good co op space, they ban it. Actually, I have worked in, uh, and they have on the door, no tourists, please. So they've just completely banned visitors from the core space because it's just got completely out of hand. Right. I need you to tell me, on the left or on the right, one of these is a core space and one is an ape house in a zoo. Okay? Which one is which? Can we guess, people? Right. So just off shot here, is a gorilla. They look sort of the same, don't they? It's a bit scary. Anybody been to WeWork? No? Yes? Everybody heard of WeWork? Cool. Well, WeWork is a bit like the one on the left. Actually, WeWork is a bit like the one on the right as well. And what you actually have is all these startups and these little glass houses inside co work space. And it's like, you want to have on the sign that this is the Gorilla Maximus that does social media. And this one over here does big data. And watch this. 
if you come to the, the, the beer and you switch the beer on at four o'clock, they all come out of their little offices. Oh, beer, beer, beer. Oh my God, it is truly frightening. And this is the most frightening one. I need you to tell me on the next slide, one of these two is a person, an entrepreneur, and one is a gorilla. <laughs> Can anybody tell the difference? <laughs> Hexters, don't you just love them? Anyway, the point being is, it's a strange old word and it's getting stranger. This is really what this is all about. This is all about corporates. Startup safaris are an existence or a signal that actually corporates are spending more time with startups. And the numbers are staggering. They are genuinely off the chart. There is more venture capital, and I'm going to show a few slides in a minute. But there are more venture capital coming from corporates than you have ever seen. And if you actually watch the news feeds, the number of, for example, uh, people, I can't remember, some of you invested in Uber last week, Toyota, I think it was. Um, but there's massive amounts of capital coming in from this part of the world. And it's not going to go away. This is essentially what the graphs look like in terms of corporate investment. This is global. What's really interesting is when you dig into the detail, actually a lot of this down here is coming from international corporates. And there's more corporates now investing outside of the US than there is inside the US. Let me describe that slightly different way because this is really important for you guys to be, be aware of. Essentially, if you think about it, one of the biggest inhibitors of actually startup ecosystems is a lack of venture funding. There are a lot of venture funds in the West Coast, there's more in the US, and then there's less, let's describe it politely, in the rest of the world. It's really hard to raise a venture fund. And I'm in the process of closing one, hopefully. But it typically takes a venture fund about two years to get enough people to put money into it. Um, for a corporate to make a decision to do one of these things, it actually takes months. It doesn't take years. The other thing which is really interesting is if you go down the list of billion dollar businesses, I think, I haven't got the data on this, but it's about 90% of countries around the world have one company which is worth a billion dollars. That's a massive, massive organization which has cash, which has customers, which has reputation. <coughs> and the chances of you getting a billion dollar venture fund to open in your back garden in any of those 90% of countries is relatively slim to none. So I personally think there's a massive opportunity to leverage against those corporates to actually start to draw capital out of them. But there are inherent dangers around that. This is the number every year for the last five years of new corporate venture funds coming online. The other thing which is really interesting is because venture funds from corporates are less dependent on making a return, they actually write bigger checks as well. The average check from a corporate VC is much, much larger than a traditional VC. So what does all of this mean? One of the things that you'll discover is that corporate venture funds are much less price sensitive than a traditional VC. They're much more interested in the big opportunity than necessarily making a return from it. That's a good thing, but it also creates weird distortions in the market. So coming back to it, you've got a bigger check and they're less price sensitive. That does strange things in the market. And it's not unsurprising if I flip back at those two slides, that actually, for those that know and have been following the market, there was a blip in the market 
late last year where everything suddenly slowed down and everything felt overpriced. And there is an argument that actually the inclusion of all of this corporate funding which was coming into the market has actually distorted the market. And it's causing a bit of an issue. Now clearly what's happened is subsequently there's been a couple of quarters down here where there's been less capital coming into the market. But that's the, the potential risk of corporates coming in with a lot of money very, very quickly, distorting the underlying trends in the market. Right. The other thing which is really dangerous is, and I'm sure ma many of you know this, which is if you have a strategic investor inside your cap table, it can create a weird conflict of interest between the need to actually strategically make sense for a company, but equally does it make sense as a financial return. Um, this is constant and nobody has ever fixed this. And any given of the VCs that I've shown you on the corporate slide have different views about that topic. Some of them are motivated by dollars, some of them are motivated by strategic purpose. The majority of the money coming into the market today is for strategic purpose, which equally create, creates weird dynamics in the market itself. The average time for a startup to start and to get to IPO today is 12 years. It's a long journey, guys. The average lifetime of a CEO of a FTSE 100 business CEO is four years. So in theory, you have an investor and the guy who's in charge has changed three times in the period that you're growing your business, which creates also real problems. Because if he gets up one day, and you can see this, Intel recently decided that they wanted to get rid of a massive part of their portfolio. And then they changed their mind 90 days later. They sometimes struggle to understand the dynamics of this. The, the advantage we have in the market today is that there's increasing knowledge around how to run a good corporate venture fund. The other thing underneath this was there was a slide which I didn't put on which basically said in 2007, 2008, not unsurprisingly, in the middle of the economic crisis, all corporate venture funding went to zero, or near enough to zero. So they can be hugely uh, subject to the money which is coming off the floor in terms of the businesses themselves. If the business isn't making money, it's really sometimes hard to get money out of corporate VCs. So who do you know, does, does everybody know who this is? This yeah. very Cecil the Lion and the famous dentist. This to me is an analogy of corporates and startups. I personally think that a lot of corporates are getting engaged into the startup scene today because ultimately they want they see it as a sport. It's fun, it's interesting. They will get paid at the end of every month. You won't. If you're not building a business and not raising capital, you go hungry, they don't. And this is the biggest struggle that I have with startups and corporates, because if corporates act dishonorably and don't understand the dynamics of what it is to actually work with startups, they can kill them. The number of times I have seen people say, oh yeah, 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 we're, we're, we're just about to land a big contract with Vodafone. Yeah, 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 next quarter, next quarter. Oh, now I have no money. And what's ended up happening is they've just been passed from pillar to post inside the organization itself. And that is not what we want to see. We want to educate. We have a responsibility to educate corporates to let them better understand what it is to work with early stage businesses so that they don't end up killing startups around them. So what does all of this mean? I personally don't think it's going away. I think corporates are here to stay. I think it's more like the start rather than the end. I think there's going to be a lot of corporates locally, both here, 
and wider in Europe more particularly that are actually going to become much more engaged in and around the ecosystem, whether that's for innovation, whether that's for startups. We've got to get used to it, and they've got to get used to us. The other thing that people actually have to think about really hard, and this is a really good example of this, is Microsoft do an accelerator, and they take no equity. I personally think that most corporate accelerators should never take equity. I think the idea of you having a strategic investor as your very first investor sucks. I think the most valuable thing you can do for a corporate is teach them what it is to do innovation, but also to help them implement through their customer base innovative technologies. They are inherently going to create value themselves when you help them by adding value to their customers. You don't need to be giving up equity. I think that's something that we should be pushing harder and harder. And finally, corporates have to take a responsibility to learn to behave, without which they genuinely will be real car crash in the system. But they have money, but more importantly, they have customers. So let's go and get some corporates in this get them involved in this ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. That was very amusing. Uh, so John here made a pretty bold statement. The corporates are here to stay. So for a moment, I would just like to speak to the audience. And who, who agrees with John after the presentation? May I see some hands? Who agrees that corporates are here to stay? Who doesn't? Okay. Who okay. doesn't think that corpus, the thing that corpus is going to run away? Is it no? Is it no? Or they take a selfie. Okay, one person. <laughs> no, but basically, for me, it seems that what is happening is that corporates are actually disrupting the VC market. So, if you were working for a non corporate accelerator, what would be your pitch to startups? How would you persuade them to join you and not Google Ventures or Microsoft? I would say they're rubbish. I would say that they don't know what they're doing. I would say that actually, uh, if you're interested in making a shit ton of money, you should work with professionals. And that's all? Like, like what do you have to offer? No, I mean, the thing that investors are actually really good at is their they're, they're, they're number one priority is making money for their LPs. We're going to have to go that was really good, wasn't it? Cool. Oh, we got matching shoes. Yeah. Um, so, um, VCs get a bad rap for good reason because sometimes it can be arseholes. Um, um, but actually, at the end of the day, they, they can't take money from one source and they have to make money. The key to that is if you get good VCs, they align the interest of the founder and they, they align their own personal interests and together it's all about making money. Um, there are other smarter VCs who will do much more than that in terms of trying to create value in different ways. But I think they, pers I personally think they tend to be the exception to the rule rather than the norm. Okay, uh, one more question before we open the floor to the audience. Uh, we're running out of time. So basically, the thing is, you said that most of the money invested in startups is actually overseas. So can you tell us more about emerging markets like Bangalore, India, in Beijing, China, and when that shift is going to happen, like from the states and let's say Europe to uh, Far East? I think it already has shifted. Um, so interestingly, I was with someone from China. Uh, which day of the week was it? Saturday. So it was Tuesday, Wednesday this week, and they are already thinking about how do they do bridging money both from China into the, into Europe and the UK and vice versa. Um, but this this be just straightforward and simple. California and Silicon Valley doesn't have a monopoly on entrepreneurs. Like it's not like the rest of the world doesn't know how to build great, interesting businesses. I think. The, the rocket fuel which exists and recognition that outside of the valley that you can go and build interesting businesses 
is just spreading like wildfire. I, I genuinely believe, I'm more optimistic every day about the opportunities for startups globally than they exist in the US, particularly with the politics as stuffed up as it is. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, are there any questions for John? We actually have time for only one question. So, let me see. Okay, there's a hand over. Okay. But please make it like very straightforward, straight to the point. Okay. It's okay, I'll just talk too much. Yeah. Okay. I can.